Whatever she said, that's what we're doing. <laughs> Did y'all know anything about the middle kids? They're very, very, um, they train you as a parent. They train you. Because the first daughter just did it all conventionally. The second daughter does not. Uh, she, yeah, she works out a lot. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so Lindsay K. Um, our thing that Tony and I worked through with Lindsay K was we could not even get her to agree to disagree. She would like, I disagree. So, um, some of the things that she did, I did get, a, I may have gotten a call from a state trooper because her and her sister on the way to Monterey School were in the ditch fighting and thank goodness it was a friend. Jamie Lynn was in the backseat crying. And he just put them all back in the car at Esper from school and they made it. Um, Lindsay K would always want to order everything specifically. Um, so one time I didn't get her order. I was going to do Kentucky Fried Chicken. So she jumped on the back of the truck as I drove out from the arena. And she hit her head on a beam of the barn, fell under the truck, but thank goodness we had just hauled in the sand because the truck ran over, but she wasn't hurt. So there was a lot of adventures with Lindsay. 
she um, made it through school at LSU, and then she went to law school, and she uh, was very, very proud of her. She went uh, to Southern and did a great job. And, you know, Southern actually has a, a there are a lot of biblical teachers there. And so she would call me all the time. She'd say, I'm so blessed because this lady is, this lady's laying it down to all these other students about our law began in the Bible. You know, I'd never thought about it. So we learned all of that. Then she has three girls, Ezra, Reveille May, and Hadley McCoy. And um, they were, uh, Papa T and I, Tony and I are very blessed proud of all of our children. They all have different things that we're so proud of them for. And so I thank y'all for being patient because she had some things that did not go right. But you know, Satan attacks. John know Satan attacks. And so um, we're not going to let him win. We're going to keep going. So with that said, this is Lindsay K. Dupree. And forget that part about being in the ditch fighting. <laughs> Okay. So, thank y'all. Okay. Um, is up there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, I cannot see. So, um, this is funny. I want to tell y'all a story real, real quick. Um, I'm gonna have her play this in just a second. Um. Actually, you know what? Let me tell you what's happening here. Um, what I learned or relearned this week is like just get out of his way. Uh, whenever we were in our first session, I told you, oh, well, I didn't tell you, but I told some of the ladies in our breakout session a moment ago that um, something happened on Sunday. I had to kind of completely rewrite my message because uh, my mind went completely blank. All of my uh, notes and studying, all the lessons I learned the hard way, I could not, I couldn't tap into it. I didn't know what was going on, and it was very stressful. Um, so I had two different breakouts. Um, one I had already created, and then you know how you doubt yourself and you say, just, I don't know, that's not going to be good. Just forget about that. And then another one that was sort of based off of what I spoke on in, this morning. But then, as Ms. Edith was uh, speaking, she talked about Psalm 139. And it was like a quickening in my heart where, where he said, you should do that first breakout that you, did, that you wanted to do. And it's like, no, um, I didn't complete that. And I, I didn't refine it. It's not going to be great. It's not going to be great, you know. And then um, we're sitting eating lunch. And my sister, Jamie Lynn, uh, I'll have her come tell you a story in a minute, but she was telling us a story about um, a patient that came in. I'm not really sure if y'all call them clients or patients, client. So a client come in, I'll let her tell you where she works at too. Um, I love the way mom says what she does. I'll still, I'll, I'll say it in a minute, but she had a client come in and was praying over this client and something she said affected, impacted the client immediately. So because of that, Okay. I'm going to yield. <laughs> I'm going to wing it when you really shouldn't be winging it. Um, but it's not so winged that we're all going to be sitting here and thinking, what is she doing? So <laughs> I'm going to have Candace play this video for you. And if you can, before she does it, I want to take just a second. And get real solemn and quiet with your Lord. Just say a little, just a little prayer. Lord, what is about to, what I'm about to hear, what I'm about to see. Um, let it let it sink in. Don't think about anything else. Even if you want to close your eyes, I would say don't. Because the video is going to be exactly what you need to see. And then you guys are going to have lots of grace for me as I fumble through this very unfinished break breakout. But I hope and I think that's going to bless you because he said it would. <laughs> okay? Alright, Candace. The um the Lockridge, my king. What? The breakout, the the first one is the 
Got it? Oh, no, no, not that one. <laughs> Hold on, this is my middle kid. <laughs> Don't want to play that, too. I want y'all to see what I'm dealing with. Can you start that over? <laughs> Listen, I'm going to tell y'all, I talked about parenting being hard. It's, it is hard raising yourself. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Everything I gave, I'm getting. <laughs> so, here's Ramily May Dupree. And all Reveille made Dupree's glory. That's a fan. I just spit it out. So, as you know, we have these. I have my bracelet, but I learned it too long at night, so here's what happened. See that little mark right, that big mark right there? That's what happened. And I had it get surgery. It was bad because I lost insurance too. Oh, no insurance. <laughs> so, that's where I almost died. Dead. And I lied this whole time. She lied. <laughs> she can't believe it. She's sick of herself. That did not lie about this. <laughs> but I did lie about having surgery and getting on the doctor the other day. She done. So, so. <laughs> oh my God. Um, we, Dory says to free. We rodeo. But rodeos are like, we have uh, lots of horses. I have a uh, horse. Um, so now that I get gray right hair, I like to say that I'm rolling out. <laughs> She's part of the reason. Um, Anyway, I think that's kind of funny that that actually played since you just told everybody all my dirty secrets. <laughs> <laughs> all right, can you play this video? The Bible says, my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of the Lord. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a father of king. No means of measure can define his limited return. He's enduring the storm. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the lofty idea in literature. He's the highest personality 
talks a lot, I know at least in my talk, I talk a pretty good bit about the state of the world. You know, at the tip of our finger, we have the ability to know a whole world's worth of problems. Um, and the more that I see, um, the more it sort of, it grieves me um, a lot because we're supposed to be, in Christ, we're supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus, right? A heart for a broken world. But the more and more I see, the more the world just breaks my heart. But we can't give up. That's that's the reason why we're here. We're soft and light. That's what, that's my little, has everybody got their little thing? I'm going to have y'all share that in a while. But my little thing is salt and light. Salt preserves, salt purifies, salt does all sorts of things, but if we lose our saltiness, then Jesus says that you got nothing. So we have to stay a little salty. I like that, because in the South, we're real sweet, but Southern women are real salty. <laughs> like, just play play with our kids, or do something silly like that, and we'll just come up, play with our kids, our family, we'll come up glued. I like to say I lose my Jesus a little, have a whole come apart. <laughs> anyway, I spent a lot of time with um, the youth at our church for two and a half years. I spent every Wednesday night um, leading small groups. Well, actually longer than two and a half years, three and a half years, because I had girls from their sophomore year all the way to high school. And a lot of them would tell me it's really, really hard to feel intimacy with Jesus because Jesus, you know, he, he felt so far away from them. And so what I would do often was try to explain to them um, that there, there's not a chasm of sky and planet between us and him because he left the Holy Spirit with us. So that actually means if he lives within us, then he's actually closer than our skin. And he, the only separation we suffer from him is the breath of a prayer. That's it. You don't talk to him. It's not that he's not there. It's just that you're not acknowledging it. Right? So one of the things that I wanted to talk about in this very unfinished <laughs> workout was that if we don't know the truth about who God is and who we are, the world will take the opportunity to lie to us. And that's what I see happening. We're letting, the world is letting itself kind of devour its own self because it just acknowledged who God was. So, God is who he says he is. And in the book of Exodus, God actually told the Israelites who he is. And what they did, whenever I tell you this definition, what they did is they would use this to encourage themselves. Oftentimes, whenever they would gather, they would say this is not a verse back then, but this is what they would say. God told them in Exodus 34, 5, 6, Candace, I don't have any slides for this because I'm winging it. Sorry. Uh, he said, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He, that's who he says he is. That's how he defines himself to us. So anyone that speaks differently of that definition does not know God as the way he describes himself. So your experience isn't truth, right? Truth is truth. Truth is objective. It's not subjective. So whenever you hear the, someone in the world say, I'm just speaking my truth, do not adopt that, reject that, rebuke that actually, because no, the, your experience might have been true, but that doesn't mean that that's the truth. That's a truth, maybe, but that's not the truth, okay? So, the world will try to convince you that he is not who he says he is, and you'll believe it if you don't know better. We question his goodness because we question our own sometimes. We're not, um, we're not naturally good. We were created good. Humans were created, and God called it good. But then after the fall in, in the Garden of Eden, now sin has entered the world. 
and we are all actually born in the nature of Adam, which is fallen. And that's why we say when we're born again, we're now born in the nature of Christ, reborn in the nature of Christ. Now we're good because he covers us. Does that make sense? All right, that's something that I've been having to tell the youth because they don't understand that. And I didn't understand that because I didn't come to Christ until, you know, in my very early 20s. But I wanted, I didn't know that. And so sometimes if I'm telling you something, it's not because I don't think you don't know. It's because I sat with myself for a long time and just didn't ask these questions. I just kind of, I used my own human wisdom to try to figure these things out. Um, and that's just not the way to go about it. Um, his love for us is based on who he is and not who we are. And Paul said in Hebrews, which is um, another little fun fact, because we don't know really who wrote Hebrews, but it can be attributed to Paul. But Paul said in Hebrews that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. And that means God made himself known. That our God walked among us, loving, healing, and forgiving us for us and dying for us, overcoming death, and then imparting his Holy Spirit within us. I'm not going to go through all the different religions, but I do want to point out something about Jesus that not everyone knows. With other religions, they claim they have a God, right? Very important difference is, let's talk about Buddha, right? So Buddha actually had a wife, and his wife had a child. He left his child, he left his wife after having birth in search of truth. Key difference. Jesus says, I am the truth. Big difference. And then we can also look at Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad said he once visited heaven. Anyone want to care to guess the difference between Muhammad and Jesus? Jesus called heaven home. He ascended and he descended and ascended that's a key difference it's a big deal god made himself known in two ways by his word and by his son and james says draw near to him and he will draw near to you so one of the things two of the things that we should be doing you study his word to know his character so you'll know who god is right and then you study Jesus to know his nature. Does that make sense? Because we know Jesus, if he's the exact representation of God, then that means everything that he does, everything that he says, this is how you learn the heart of God. And the Bible will tell you about all these different actions. And really, it's just a rescue story. It's rescuing the relationship between creator and created. Do you know that relationship was was a hundred percent God's idea? So if you go back to Genesis, um, chapter two in Genesis, after He created the universe and then the mystery of beauty, He then made man, and He walked in the cool of the garden with Him. That's our first relationship. That's why we say He's our first love. And then he made a companion, Eve. So he created interpersonal relationship. And he called us the Azir. So we were not, we're not helper the way that we understand it in the South, right? In the South, that's just someone that might be a little more inferior to you in your job. But that is not what the concept was. It's the complimenter. So that's kind of helpful to know. <laughs> The next thing to understand is you are who he says you are. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And in love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. In accordance with his pleasure and will. He created you as you are in your female form. Totally equipped to do all the things that he has for you and that he's got planned for you. I don't think the world has identity issues, right? Right now we're pretty aware of all the, the things that people are identifying as. 
of, I don't think it's necessarily an identity issue. I think it's an issue from understanding from whence your identity comes from. Does that make sense? So your identity is established in your formation by him. So any identity that you give yourself outside of how he created you is a false identity. And so what we have is a broken world that's walking around with false identities that they keep giving themselves because they don't know the Lord. And if we want change to happen, it has to happen with boots on the ground. We're in. There's, he's already saved the world. So what we got to do is go and tell, tell people about him, but not just with our words. It's got to be our actions, and there's never a greater ministry field than your home and the people that are around you. It's just like Mordecai whenever he sort of begged Esther to stand and, her, stand and go into her destiny. Maybe you were made for such a time as this. Is it difficult? Yes, especially I talked about earlier about parenting your kids. Well, I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm kind of parenting other people's kids whenever they're at, at our crew is what we call it. Um, not because their parents aren't, but because I'm another adult influence in their life. You have no idea what you can say or do that might impact somebody's child for the rest of their life. That is a great responsibility. So when we see other children or other young women, um, I make it a point to speak into their life a little bit and find out a little bit about them because I want them I want them to be a part of the chosen, right? The other thing that they tell me often, you know, how I said earlier that they don't feel God. And I think sometimes you got to tackle some of that stuff right where it's at. Because I tell them feelings are not facts. Feelings are great communicators and they're great companions. But they are terrible masters. They will lead you into destruction. And so what the trick is, is teaching your feelings the truth. Teaching your feelings to obey the truth. And that's a tough thing because right now the whole world is sort of um, embracing feelings. When really we're supposed to take those feelings and hold them captive and make them obedient. A fish doesn't know what water is, right? You ever heard that old metaphor? It doesn't know what water is because that's what it is always ever known. It is the same way with us and God. When you feel far away from God, teach your feelings to a better truth. He is all around you. You know nothing else but him. And I don't want to live in a world where he doesn't exist because it's called hell. And I don't want to go there. If it's hotter than Louisiana, no thank you. I'm so done sweating. I think I'm sweating right now. <laughs> I'm sick of sweating. Um, the other thing I wanted to break down for y'all is I'm just going to read the entire passage of Psalm 139. Okay. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light as you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderful made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book 
before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them, were I to count them. They would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked away from me, O oh, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent, and your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I, call, I count them my enemies, and search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I just wanted to read that whole thing, just so that we are really, really clear on making your feelings obey if you feel like God is far away from you. It's absolutely not true. And he's very interested in everything that you're interested in. But I do want to go back to Psalm 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book and before one of them came to be. You are seen. You were a concept in his mind before conception in the womb. Every detail was carefully curated, and you bear the maker's signature. And that should convince us that every human life has an innate value, and it's lovingly and intentionally created, chosen, and with a purpose. No matter its location or stage of development, whether womb or hospice, whether nursery or deathbed, innate value. You are the very proof that at one time you completely occupied the mind of the Father. For that moment that you were being knitted together in the womb, all his, you somehow, I cannot explain it, we'll never be able to explain it, at least not on this side of heaven, that it's possible that you still are the center of attention. Jamie Lynn said something earlier during a prayer over me. She said, you're still the apple of his eye. I just think that's so brilliant. Whenever I do make it to heaven, <laughs> and I am with him, I hope that there's a Q&A session because I have lots of questions, and those are my favorite things. Questions are my favorites. So that's going to be one of mine. Like, how do you do it? You know, this infinite capacity to love each one of us infinitely, just amazing. I'm gonna go back to one through four of Psalm 139. You are fully known. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me, and you know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Um, that, does that like worry anybody else or is that just me? Am I the only little weirdo that I'm like, oh, he all over my head. <sighs> That's not a safe place to be most days. Um, I scare myself. <laughs> and one and I'm like, praise you. And then the next I'm like, oh goodness on this house. I'm going to move your part. So there's a lot going on up here. <laughs> so, but on a more serious note, I wonder how many of you sometimes feel like you live in a house full of strangers. That you're doing all the cooking, all the cleaning, the homework, the clean clothes, the clean floors. You're getting the dog fed, you're bathing the dog, you're peeling the dog off of other people. I say this because my dog is completely another child. He's always trying to eat people. Um, but you're, you're taking on everyone else's needs and sometimes you just kind of seem, you feel unnoticed or you, you feel unseen. Or for my, for my kind of like boss girls, um, <laughs> maybe you have customers and clients and employees and you gotta make big girl decisions and you don't wanna make big girl's decisions today, but you gotta make the big girl decision because if you don't make the decision, nobody eats um, the employees don't get paid, and you can't pay the bills, and your business shut down, and just that is a lot of responsibility, and it's just a lot to take on. 
And what these scriptures tells us is that he knows. No one knows your heart better than the one that created it. But he knows. And the scriptures before that say that you're seen. You are scarily seen, actually. I find that that should give us some comfort. Um, it doesn't take all the anxiety away. It doesn't take the reality away. Kind of like what I said earlier, um, being yoked, yielding and being yoked doesn't take any of this stuff away. But it does give you the confidence to know that if you yield and you stay yoked and you remain, that you're going to be able to overcome those things. That he'll start kind of loving on you. Um, doing these small things for you that you feel like other people should be doing, but you gotta open up your eyes and don't get bitter and don't let, you know, things that, things that start to affect your heart, don't do that. Keep, your, keep a good perspective about everything. If you're starting to feel like, man, I, I wish somebody bring me coffee, sure is nice. I'm bringing him coffee, sure is nice. Instead of that, Man, I get another day that I have coffee. And coffee is life. So, <laughs> do you know? Uh, just finding the sweetness and all the little things. I promise you, if you keep a, just a positive perspective, it sounds very Pollyanna. I don't care. I don't care. I get called Pollyanna in my office all the time. I don't care. I'm happier than you. So, <laughs> You think I want to come to the miserable team? No. I like to win. I'm an athlete. I love to win. That's winning. I, I want to lose. Even when I lose, I'm winning. Because I'm going to keep a positive attitude. If you're grateful for what he's given you, it is impossible to stay in the pit. It is. You cannot praise and be in the pit at the same time. You can feel like you're in the pit. Again, we go back to teach your feelings to tr the truth. The truth is, is, I feel like I'm in the pit. I'm not. I'm in his hand. That's it. Keep your perspective positive. He knows you. Um, and then next, and uh, I do want to remind you because I love telling the, this always seems to really get my girls and the youth. The Bible is the most, this thing right here, I don't know about you, um, I, I, I like to call my, I'm like a self-proclaimed Bible destroyer. I go, this is about my fourth one in the past four years. Uh, I rip this thing apart, I write it all up, I highlight it up, and then I go get a fresh one. The reason why is because the youth tend to think, and, and I'm calling on y'all to change this, the youth tend to think that this thing is so old, that there's nothing in it that I can really relate to. And I tell them now, go open up the New Testament. If you do anything, go open up the New Testament and just start reading John, because that's the one I go to the most. John and go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Go to some of these that are talking about that these churches were in a culture not unlike ours. There's a cultural, warf it's cultural warfare going on. There's um, spiritual exhaustion. And then a lot of the New Testament is about being prepared for false teaching. And I tell them, the culture that Jesus entered the scene into is not at all unlike yours. It's a Greco-Roman world where your truth is truth and anything goes a sort of thing. So it does, it does relate to what's going on these days. So when Jesus comes into the scene, he enters into a culture of confusion. But he was not at all confused about who he, who he was. He sent the Pharisees into a heart of stroke, like every three seconds. <laughs> because they were walking around with some false identity. They had all the answers. They had the access to the scrolls. They could do whatever they wanted. They're making up all these new laws. And here he comes, he's very sure of his identity. And that just seems that that just does something to people that are struggling with it. In a confused culture, Jesus knew exactly who he was. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. 
He confidently claimed to be God and forgave sins, and that was scandalous. He had a lot of followers, but how many of those followers were actually haters? All right. Do y'all know how many? Do y'all know about this? Do y'all have kids? Who's got kids? Teenagers, and they have social media, and they have they have people that follow them or they follow whatever. Well, a lot of your followers can be haters. People that are just um, they're just scrolling your page, trying to see what other silliness, what crazy business you're putting out there. You know, there's a lady in my office. I'm not gonna name her name. God bless her. Um, she loves to laugh about this one particular woman that posts just the wildest stuff on her her page, and she gets a kick out of it. She's a hater. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I don't say anything. I'm just like, wow. But um, the Pharisees followed Jesus around too. Absolute haters, right? <laughs> Having followers doesn't mean that they're committed to you. They followed him around because his commitment to God's word forced them to examine themselves, their motives, and their lifestyles. But he didn't entertain their rejection. And he didn't internalize it either. He stayed who he was. I thank God for that. When they gave him hell, he gave them heaven. And so I want Jamie to come up and tell that little story about your client. And then we're gonna I'm gonna do y'all let y'all do an activity real quick. Did you were y'all okay with sort of just entertaining me with that? Let me just kind of wing that for you. Was that good? Okay, good. I think it was infinitely better than what I had otherwise, but um, he moved me and after this week I'm not gonna ever take a charge again. <laughs> I'm Jamie Pally, and that's his sister. I'm the baby. But, um, yeah, so I'm an ultrasound tech, and I worked at St. Francis, like, medical center in the hospital for, like, seven, eight years. And, um, but then, like, I got pregnant, and the Lord, um, you know, I, Jonathan, my husband, was like, we should go to church. Like, get involved. You know, because we want our kids to um, be raised in, like, a Christian environment, like how he was raised. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And so we went. We were thinking, like, this is for the our kid, you know, through street life. And then little did we know, like, it was for us. And the Lord has completely wrecked our lives, like, in the most beautiful way. And so, like, praise God. So I say all that to say, um, you know, it was put on my heart to, like, go part-time. You know, just to um, have more time with my boys and, like, with, um, like, for the Lord, like, whatever he wanted. And so um, he gave me the opportunity from work at Pregnancy Resource Center in Monroe, Louisiana, and um, it has been like the coolest experience. I would have never thought, you know, that like me being quiet and timid um, and just, I don't know, just not one that would share the gospel or just love on others, um, I get to do that now. So these girls come in, you know, and it's a lot of times like crisis pregnancies, you know, they're upset, you know, like um, questioning like with the dad, you know, or who's the baby daddy and all those things and so it's just a lot but like the most beautiful thing comes in like they'll come in and um, we get to like love them like where they're at you know unconditional and a lot of those girls have like never been truly loved um without like conditions you know so last week i was just telling Lindsay and the girls at my table i was like i have this beautiful soul come in like beautiful inside and out and you can just see like the sweetest spirit inside of her but um, she had a, no, she has a nine month old kiddo. And so she had come in and said like, I'm going to take the abortion pill. Like I'm going to order them um, if I'm pregnant. And so we were getting confirmation and we talked with her and um, she came into my room and you know, she was just real quiet. And you know, I was able to share like, look sister, like whatever you choose, I'm going to love you no matter what, because like, I love you as my sister. But I was able, um, we could see the heart tone and see that baby at the kitchen around eight or nine weeks. And so, um, anyway, after I scanned and she saw, like, I prayed over her. And um, it was just the sweetest moment, you know. But, like, uh, I just prayed. And I, for some reason, felt the need to, like, ask her, like, what's your boy's, what's your baby boy's name? That nine-month-old. And she just burst into tears. And she was like, you said it when you prayed. 
prayed, and I was like, Lord, did I say like in a little boy's name when I prayed, you know? And um, she was just weeping, and she was like, Jamie, his name is Chosen. And I was like, my goodness, what a name, you know, like the power. I was just amazed. It was so beautiful. And then I was like, well, sister, just how he, his name is Chosen, like his kiddo, this, this kiddo is Chosen. And she hugged me and wept, and we had a moment. But, um, yeah, it's just you never know, like just trying to be obedient to um, where the Lord brings you and, like, being bold and confident and just sharing just love it. So, is that all Okay. How, how much time do we have? Okay. So, my thoughts were, um, you don't have to move around. If you're kind of comfortable where you're at, that's fine. If you kind of already sort of sat grouped. But I thought one of the best, um, one of the best things that ever happened to me was whenever I went to, when I met my husband, I had the honor Okay, uh, it's my own little miracle story. Of uh, I met my husband, and our third date, he took me to church. <laughs> I was I wasn't not living right. I, I mean, I just wasn't saved. So I I was just okay. I was like, he's so cute. I will go anywhere with you. Okay, anywhere. Do you want to go to the Seven Eleven? Sure, we can do that. <laughs> but anyway, but instead he was like, um, do you want to go to church? I was like, sure. So we go to, uh, we used to go to a healing place many years ago, and I can distinctly remember being, he wanted to sit close to, and I was like, close? Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> but again, we go sit close, and this dude knows everybody. Uh, it is crazy. I am, what is it whenever you're, is it, are you an extroverted introvert when you actually can talk, but you don't want to? And <laughs> Or is it an introverted extrovert whenever you like secretly don't want to talk, but you still do it? I don't know. I don't know. See, it's confusing. This is why he doesn't need to be here. He's got clarity and I do not. So anyway, point being, as I remember, if you've ever been inside the building, you walk in and there's a million chairs. A million. Well, it wasn't the big arena then. It was just a smaller facility. But I walk in, he walks me on the side of the rail, third row, sixth seat. I am losing it. I am getting saved. It doesn't matter about this guy over here. I might not ever see him again. That's okay. Because I'm having a real experience of where I have just been impacted by the power of Christ. So it was incredible. That's my that's part of my salvation story. Now that doesn't mean that there wasn't seed sown. Aunt Tracy dropped a ton of little seeds. Um, there's different people in my life. Uh, we had grandmothers that prayed that understood the power well before we did. But I had the pleasure of falling in love with him and Jesus at the same time. So it was a huge miracle story in my life. It changed lots of things for me. Um, and I'm, ask, I'm telling you what I would like for us to do it is no, we don't have time for everyone to share every bit of your testimony. But I want you to, you can get groups of six, five, whatever you want to do. But share a little bit about when you found out who God was, who you were in Him. Tell each other about, let's share it. Share it like recipes. That's what we're here for. We're here to share, right? And maybe when you're sharing your stories, you'll share each other's telephone number, <laughs> you know? Get in touch, make some friends. That's what these things are about. Um, and because I, I, I know I've made lots of friends from different conferences. Uh, and also, too, sometimes when you share a love, it sparks a love. And Tracy, whenever she invited me to go to a Carrie Joe concert many, many years ago, I was in the process of learning about God, I was falling in love with Him. Um, but when we went, who's Carrie Joe fans? Do I have any Carrie Joe fans? Okay, then y'all already know. You already know she will wreck your world. And she did. So the thing is, is it wasn't just the lyrics of the songs and Carrie's angelic voice. That was really helpful. That was a good part of it. But what really got me was the parts where she would speak about Jesus. 
And I just remember thinking, I want that. That's what I want. I want to know the nearness of the Lord the way she does, the way she talks about him. Holy smokes. How do you know Jesus like that? What in the world is that? The Holy Spirit, I can feel it. And so because of that seed that was sown, that just, in God's time, that just bloomed. So I want, I'm, I'm telling you that because you never know what part of your story just lands with somebody and just blooms. So let's just take some time. You can move around, um, get in circles, however you want to do it. Lean over on the back seat and say, I'm not moving because I'm comfy, but I do want to know about your story, girl. <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. Hey Candace, is there any, is there some like music you can put on real 